थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव शीनम यू वांट टू स्टार्ट टुडे वी हैव वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक दैट इज ग्रोथ मॉडरेशन फॉर डिफॉर्मिटी करेक्शन which is used in various kinds of uh, various kind of diseases uh, will be sorry if there was some network issue uh, to, today we have a uh, morning shah sir for the uh, growth modulation uh, topic right so thanks shinam uh, <clears throat> so i heard from uh, uh, dr anil agrawal that we we had uh, a webinar with dr peter stevens and uh, he is a current era bishma pitama of uh, growth modulation treatment for various indications uh, in pediatric orthopedics and uh, i hope this talk uh, will give you a bit of uh, technical aspects uh, of the uh, the procedure and uh, the experience which i have uh, gained so far so uh, we all know that uh, conventional treatment of angular deformity in children needs uh, corrective osteotomies and fixation with implants and plaster immobilization we know the drawbacks of this uh, surgical procedures that uh, it needs a major surgical intervention there is prolonged hospitalization plaster immobilization usually is for 4 to 6 weeks and during this time children they are off the school days and even after plaster removal they have to undergo tedious rehab and it takes about a month from them to rejoin the school so totally they lose about 2 to 3 months time and again the implant removal after a year or so would need major intervention so um because of this drawbacks uh, the growth modulation treatment came into picture growth modulation concept is not new in 1700s uh, famister started this by uh, by uh, destroying the the physis on the Uh, one side and so the opposite side would keep on growing so this was uh, done uh, way back but due to that it was used only uh, in patients near skeletal maturity so growth modulation by definition is utility of remaining growth to correct the deformity now this that was a, a historic uh, way of doing growth modulation but in current era there are three ways we can do growth modulation the one and very popular method was staple putting a staple to induce hemi epiphysodesis the screws percutaneously placed screws is another way and the tension bent plates or eight plate these are these are these are three methods and when we talk about staples it was started by blounts in 1949 but staples is a compression device and when we use a compression device we always have a fear that it would lead to a permanent closure of the physis underneath and that we cannot use it in younger children because if uh, the physis get sick then child might develop an uh, opposite deformity the complications in various papers which has been described by staple is migration of staples or breakage and the key thing is fulcrum of correction when we put a staple is at the compression site which is intramedullary and so correction is slower compared to the implant which is placed on the periosteum or outside the bone now tension band uh, plates or or principles which was which is popularized by peter stevens and he first published in 2007 uh, is based on uh, the tension bend principle 
small plates in various sizes with uh, 4.5 millimeter fully threaded cancellous screws, which has an angle of 15 degrees. So uh, from each screw, it span by 15 degrees. So one can correct up to 30 degree of deformity. And once this 30 degrees of deformity is corrected, the implant starts backing out to induce further correction. And what is important is it is placed on the outer side of bone over the periosteum. And so the, the fulcrum uh, is at the periosteal side and there is a bigger lever arm. So it is theoretically and uh, practically also, it has shown that it induces 30% faster correction than the staple device. When we use staples, the fulcrum of, uh, of compression is uh, intramedullary. And so we have a shorter lever arm and shorter lever arm needs more force and more time to correct the deformity. Let me uh, explain to you now with a very uh, simple basics. Now, uh, look at this door and there are three hinges on one side and handle uh, is on this side. So when the handle is away from the hinge, it is very easy to open this door. Now, if I move this fulcrum near the hinge, so uh, for instance, if I move the handle here, you will realize that this will need a lot of force and the opening of the door will be also slower. So this is the principle of tension bend and the fulcrum and lever arm distance. Uh, so if you are more away from the hinges or the point of correction, then the correction would be faster. So what we do in uh, uh, growth modulation with tension bend plates, for instance, this is a persistent genuvarum after nutritional deficiency. And uh, in genuvarum, the inner side is growing less faster. So what we need to do is we to put a staple kind of device. We would put a tension bend plate on the outer side of femur. So the inner side would keep on growing and eventually it will correct the mechanical axis. So this is the uh, uh, basic principle or technique uh, of this. And surgical technique is very straightforward. The conventional technique described by Peter Stevens is you put a small or thin guide wire through the physis for a few millimeters uh, percutaneously and confirm its placement on image intensifier, both on AP and lateral view, and then make an one inch of incision spanning above and below the guide wire. And then you go right deep and uh, remove whatever smooth, which you can hold with your forceps and do not injure the periosteum. Uh, and once you do that, uh, you guide the plate from the central portion and then put your two guide wires. You might pre-drill it and these 4.5 screws are self-taping. So, uh, so they tighten the screws one by one. And uh, now this is uh, the technique video from someone else, but the screws need not to be this long. You know why I'll tell you in a moment. So this is the conventional method. And once you are well trained to do this, it doesn't take more than 10 minutes to finish this procedure. And compared to the osteotomies and uh, the incisions of osteotomy and rehab, this is fairly straightforward. Uh, procedure fairly um, uh, easy with very less learning curve and most importantly it is very child friendly where we can make them walk on day day one or day two. A modified technique has been described recently by Dror Fele and there's one paper from Argentina which compares the conventional uh, technique described by Peter Stevens and the one with Dror Fele. Uh, so what they do here, they do not put any wire into the physis. Sometimes putting a central wire through the undulating physis is difficult, uh, but they put a wire into the epiphysis. Then they put the plate over the skin and they put the second wire. Now these wires need not to be parallel, you know, uh, they can be a bit of uh, divergent, that is okay. And once they put two wires, they, they remove the plate and they join the incision joining these two wires. And then they guide the plate inside uh, and they fix it. So this incision, uh, this modified technique has a smaller incision and a smaller radiation exposure and so on. But uh, 
uh, you can do it either way and uh, uh, this procedure should not take more than uh, six to 10 minutes. Now the question is what should be the length of screws? Now this biomechanical study which has been done, it shows that uh, as this, um, this technique works on tension bend principle, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if you put a small screw or a large screw. But screw length should not uh, be too small because especially in metabolic bone disease, when the bones are weak, there is a there is a subtle uh, possibility that screw would back out. And if your screw is small, it would lose the capacity of providing tension bend principle. That's one. And when the deformities are larger, where you are expecting larger deformity, uh, as I mentioned, once the deformity corrected uh, to the span of plate, then this plate would back out to give more correction. And in that instance, if you are using a very small screw, that screw will, uh, uh, will back out and it will not serve uh, as a tension band tool. So that's why we need to have uh, uh, not too small screw. At the same time, you don't need too large screw, uh, which I saw in the previous uh, slide. Now, one important point which I learned from Dr. William Cole at Sick Kids that the length of epiphyseal screw is very important. Uh, and whenever you put an epiphyseal wire or screw, always internally rotate the extremity and so that you can see the femoral condylar ridge. So this is the femoral condylar ridge. Your guide wire or your uh, screw should not proceed beyond this point. The reason is if you see the axial cut of femoral head, I mean, sorry, femoral condyle, the uh, popliteal artery lies in the notch uh, of the femoral condyle. And if by mistake you go a bit too posterior, then you might uh, injure the vessel. And so uh, be careful that your wire should not go beyond this condylar ridge. And that you will be able to see in an internal rotation view of the knee. Let's see an example and how we plan and how we execute this uh, uh, procedure. This 10 years old girl with Janu valgum deformity, bilateral left side is more severely involved than the right. And she is a known case of hypophosphatemic rickets. So uh, you can see uh, the bone quality. So this patient should be simultaneously treated by uh, endocrine team or a pediatrician uh, so that the bone quality is optimum. And uh, her calcium was normal, but phosphorus was 3.2 and alkaline phosphatase was high. Uh, in hypophosphatemic rickets, one should not wait for phosphorus to normalize, but one can look at the alkaline phosphatase. If that is uh, near normal range, you can always proceed for the procedure. Now, one need to know three things before considering growth modulation. One is the, what is the deformity magnitude? So what is the degree of deformity? That's one. What is the location of the deformity? Whether it is arising from distal femur, proximal tibia, proximal femur, distal tibia. So you should be able to quantify from where it is coming. And the third and most important thing is what is the growth potential of a patient? If the if the patient's potential of growth is not too good, then your deform the, the exercise will be futile and will not work. At the same time, physical health is also important. There are some patients with very sick physis. We see the corrections are very slow. And in some patients with achondroplasia and they, they do not correct at all. So you one should be also aware about the state of physis. Now, once uh, you need to take a uh, full length scanogram with the patella facing forward. This is very important. If your patella is not neutral, then your, uh, your calculations may go wrong. So you should uh, train your radiologist uh, how to take a full length x-ray. Uh, the second thing is once you have a full length neutral x-ray, you start calculating the deformity by drawing a mechanical axis, which is from the center of the femoral head to the center of ankle joint or the distal tibia. And as we know, when the deformities, uh, the mechanical axis is passing outside the confines of femoral condyle that is in zone three, these are pathologic alignment and we need to correct them. The second step is to draw an anatomic axis or uh, the, sorry, the joint orientation line, which is placed by matching the lines 
from the distal femoral condyle, most convex part, and proximal tibia was the most concave part of tibial plateau. And then you also draw a line from the uh, uh, articular surface of distal tibia. So these are the joint orientation line. The third step is to draw the, uh, the, <coughs> the mechanical axis of femur, which goes from the, uh, the center of the femoral head to the center of the femoral condyle. And then comes the mechanical axis of tibia, which is actually the anatomical axis of tibia as well, starting from the center of the proximal tibia to the distal tibia. And then you draw for a genu valgum or genu varum deformities, which are mainly coming from the femur, uh, from the knee joint, you draw the lateral distal femoral angle. Uh, and lateral distal femoral angle normally should be 87 degrees. In this case, it is 78 on right and 73 on the left. So about 14 degrees deformity on the left and about um, nine degrees from the right. And we also made proximal medial tibial angle. And this proximal medial should be 87 degrees again, which was around 85 in this case. And so the deformity is coming both from femur as well as tibia, but mainly from femur. So my planning would be, I will correct the deformity from the femoral side. So I don't need to put the plate on the tibial side. At the same time, if this child would be near skeletal maturity, I would cheat a bit. I would put the plate on both the side to uh, achieve correction in short time. How we uh, check the growth potential? So I uh, used to take, uh, and we all try to take an elbow lateral view. And with the presence of uh, olecranon epiphysis, we can assume that how much growth is remaining. So as you can see, when the olecranon epiphysis is uh, like two dots unfused with the rest of the metaphysis, in girls, it matches the chronologic age of 11 years and they have around two years growth remaining. And once they reach the point where the olecranon is fused, they have about six months of growth remaining from the extremity, and but it is a very slow growth. So once the olecranon epiphysis is fused, the growth modulation treatment uh, uh, gives very, uh, very small correction. So you have to be aware about this. The uh, many colleagues, they used to, they see the X-ray of distal femur and proximal tibia. And from the amount of opening, which it shows on X-ray, they decide that what, uh, whether this spices is growing or not. Now that method has some fallacies because some patients also have a bit of procurvatum deformity. And in that case, the physis would, would overlap and it would kind of uh, underestimate the potential of growth. So that's not a very, uh, very good method. And the second is some people also use the menstruation age of the child. If the girl is not menstruating yet, she has good um, degrees of growth remaining. But we see a lot of uh, girls, they keep on growing even after their menstruation age. And some of them, they, they have pre-puberty and so that is also misleading. So we have found this elbow x-ray and in conjunction with other methods as a good guide of the amount of residual growth. So this is the x-ray of the girl which we were this, uh, which we're seeing and it shows that she is at 11 and a half and she has good growth remaining. So we did uh, guided growth by placing eight plates along the medial side of femur. So the lateral side would keep on growing. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, my screw is uh, stopping at the femoral condyle, as you can see on the left side. And this uh, screw size is okay. I would have placed a little bigger screw on the metaphysial side, but uh, this was my in, in initial cases, one of the initial cases. And in one and a half years, this deformity got completely corrected and the mechanical axis got neutralized. This is a clinical outcome of that girl from front and from back. So you can correct this deformity uh, this way. And there's a nice paper by Peter Stevens himself in JPO 2006, hypophosphatemic rickets, the role of hem hemiepiphysiodesis. What we see is uh, uh, these children have diaphyseal and global deformity. So when they're young, you can use, a, uh, use growth modulation to neutralize their mechanical axis. And once they become skeletally mature, we use intramedullary nails to correct the diaphyseal deformity. One more child, uh, uh, Janu Valgum, 
Now here we measured that this deformity is coming both from distal femur and proximal tibia. And so we placed uh, eight plate on both the medial uh, uh, proximal tibia and distal femur and deformity got corrected. So placing the plate is dependent on the origin of the deformity and not the age of the child. Another uh, deformity case growth modulation in obese adolescents. And there was a paper that you should put uh, um, multiple eight plates. And so I, I used that. Uh, uh, and this child, I placed two plates in distal femur. Uh, and uh, his left side deformity was also coming from tibia. So we placed it and it got corrected, uh, the mechanical axis. And this child also got corrected. Now, uh, there are papers that uh, as this technique is working on tension bend principle, you do not put two plates, only one plate should suffice. Janu Varam and growth modulation. Uh, this is uh, also, it can be done. Another case of hypophosphatemic rickets with uh, O deformity. So here we have placed uh, 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 eight plates on the lateral side of femur. And you can see that in about uh, one and a half years, the deformity got corrected. As you could see, this, this took a little longer time to correct because the disease uh, patient was not compliant with phosphorus therapy. And so it took longer time. And now, although mechanical axis is corrected, uh, the diaphyseal deformities are exist still existent. And this child uh, underwent diaphyseal correction at skeletal maturity. You might come across windswept deformity at times, genu varum on one side and genu valgum on the other side. So you choose uh, the proper site based on the x ray and your calculation. And uh, we placed uh, a eight plate on the lateral side on the left and the medial side on the right. And this is a uh, correction in about uh, nine months time. So this is how you can correct the deformity. Now, uh, growth modulation can also be used in skeletal dysplasia. Now this child and his father, they, they are the known case of uh, metaphyseal chondral dysplasia. Uh, the correction is a bit slower in uh, skeletal dysplasia because the Pisces is sick. But there is a paper recently in even in achondroplasia, if you do growth modulation earlier in the course, or as it takes longer time to correct, you have to do correction, uh, put the plates earlier, then you will achieve the correction. So in this case, I corrected both the femurs as well as the proximal femur uh, with a tension band device and correct both the deformities simultaneously. And in a year's time, the, the child got straighter. Now, a few caution you have to uh, exercise while using uh, guided growth method. Uh, as I already talked, that do not use extremely short screws. And at the same time, do not use extremely long screws so that you endanger the popliteal vessels. Screw length does not matter uh, while we use tension bend principles. The metabolic disease should be well controlled. Uh, in young children, we wait for metabolic disease to be under control before we put implants. And in children near skeletal maturity, we do it simultaneously because we have very less time to correct the deformity. It's very important to have regular follow-up at three to four months. And parents should be say that when they give consent to this procedure, they are also giving consent for implant removal once we uh, correct the deformity. That you have to explain to them uh, uh, by spending a lot of time with them because not coming into follow-up periodically, it's a biggest challenge we face in growth modulation treatment. Some people are trying to use reconstruction plates and occasionally they have shown correction, but uh, there are a lot of complications through breakage probably because uh, it is again, uh, it is working as a compression device rather than tension bend device. So try to avoid reconstruction plates. The question is when to remove the implant. That is very important. Uh, we uh, tend to remove the implant once we see a slight overcorrection, slight overcorrection by one station. So why it is so? Because in 30 to 40% patients, we, we uh, we see a rebound of deformity upon removal of implant. Now, uh, there are various opinions about Dr. Stevens says that you correct 
uh, with mild overcorrection. Some people say that when it is only 30 to 40 percent patients are showing rebound, means 60 percent they do not show. So correct it when when it is neutral. Now this paper uh, published in JPO 2017, and they are mentioning that 30 percent patients had more than 10 degrees of rebound. And which patients have more rebound? The younger patients. Well, child, male less than 12 years and female less than 10 years, they have a higher chance of rebound. And when the initial deformities is more than 20 degrees, they have rebound. So you can plan to remove the implants uh, uh, by, with a bit of overcorrection in this subset of patients, while in other patients with lesser deformity, you can remove when the mechanical axis is neutralized. And importance of timely follow-up uh, is very important. Let me share this case with you. In 2011, this boy who had a, a chronic skin disease requiring a long-term steroid therapy presented to us with uh, this sort of x-ray. And uh, my, uh, our endocrine team treated this child. And in about one year's time, his uh, bone uh, quality improved. And then we, uh, we checked that his deformities are coming from tibia and not femur. And uh, we did growth modulation uh, in the proximal medial tibia. And uh, this was in after five months. And this is uh, about a year later. Uh, you can see that deformity is nicely getting corrected on the right side, but it is it was not getting corrected as, uh, uh, as speedily on the left side probably because the metaphysical screw on the left side is backing out. I still waited the, as the child did not have any uh, problem with um, um, the impingement of anything. Uh, again, in 2014, a year later, uh, you can see the mechanical axis on the right side corrected well. But now, uh, with more correction, the left side screw is backing out more and more. Uh, so we revised the uh, plate. And I now place the metaphysical screw straight, the same screw and same plate. And uh, in a six months' time, the deformity started correcting. So this case shows that your implant uh, placement should be very precise and uh, not too small screw, especially in metabolic bone disease. So in September 2014, I advised family that you come next month and we will remove the implants. Unfortunately, they had demise of uh, grandfather in the family. And uh, again, uh, after three, four months, they one more relative uh, 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 expired. And so they could not come to me. And they came uh, all the way in 2016. And now you can see this deformity has uh, overcorrected. The child who started with Janu Valgum now has ended up into Janu Varam. And uh, so what I did, again, we removed the plates from inside and placed on the outside. And uh, fortunately, he had some residual growth and he got corrected uh, in 2018. So in seven years journey, this child finally got straight and, uh, and he is now doing very well. So it is so important uh, to explain to the family that removal of implant in time is very important. Otherwise, they would uh, develop a contralateral deformity. Now, uh, the adolescents near skeletal maturity, they pose a, uh, a separate problem. They have very limited growth potential. They need actually correct, a quick correction of the deformity. And we have seen that when we put this tension band plates or eight plate, it takes some time before they start inducing correction. This is probably the to induce, give some tension on the screws. It takes a few months and we want to bypass that time. And uh, the PAT screw or percutaneous epiphysodesis screw, which was a uh, device first used by uh, Junior Matizu in 1950s, is now resurfacing. Uh, people are started using this again for deformities near skeletal maturity. And this is the paper uh, recently published in 2016, where they have compared tension metal plates with uh, the PET screw. And they found that PET gives faster correction. It's useful near skeletal maturity. And they have also found there is less incidence of post-operative pain and stiffness compared to eight plates. We see some children have stiffness uh, even after a month, and we have to take help of therapist. And rarely, we might also need to do manipulation and anesthesia for very stiff cases. So this, this has not been observed. 
and this the author shows that to keep the screws about three to four millimeter proud for ease of removal later. So, uh, so this these are the cases from Dr. Avish and Manda Ragashe, my friends from Mumbai. Uh, for this girl of around ten years, and she had uh, very limited growth, and they have used the uh, uh, X screw, and the deformity uh, got fairly fast corrected, and then they removed it. Uh, this 13 year old uh, post menarchal girl, which, which have moderate deformity, uh, as you can see, and they use pet screw in both the distal femur and proximal tibia, and deformity partly got corrected. And family is now uh, okay with the uh, cosmesis of this, uh, this girl. So, pet screws can be used uh, near skeletal maturity. Pet screw carries a risk that the, the physis where we put it, it will lead to permanent epiphyseal disease because it's a compression device. Uh, but it's, we, we are not worried in children where they, they are nearing the skeletal maturity. There are a few more indications where you can use growth modulation. One of them is ankle valgus, which, uh, which is seen in some children with fibular hemimelia or uh, post-traumatic uh, with a very small bar. Uh, or myelomeningocil, you can use it, and it, it has shown uh, the ability to correct the ankle valgus deformity. Uh, knee flexion deformity and growth modulation. So, especially in cerebral palsy, it is now becoming very popular. And uh, Peter Stevens advocated using two uh, anterior eight plates. Uh, although they mentioned this, these are extra articular, at times it becomes intra articular and may induce. Uh, the knee synovitis. Dr. Ashok Johari has some experience with this and uh, he has warned us to put plates a little lateral. Uh, now, another method uh, uh, is um, becoming more popular uh, that is extra articular screw, screw placement with or without uh, patella tendon plication for crouch gait, uh, wherein we put the screws from the in the anterior third of femur and from the lateral side. And this is the boy with uh, where we, we did uh, semitendinosis to, uh, uh, to adductor magnus transfer at the age of nine years, and he had rebound deformity at 13 years. So we used this method, and uh, this child shown substantial improvement. You can see his deformities has gone, uh, and uh, he will be around 16 now. So if there is anything residual, we will we will correct later, but this child improved uh, one degree every year and his 20 degrees knee flexion deformity got corrected in one and a half years and he is due for implant removal. Perthes disease, uh, Dr. Benjamin Joseph has always suggested and guided us to do uh, varus derotation osteotomy. At the same time, you do drill epiphysodesis of, uh, uh, of uh, GT growth plate. Uh, the patients like this, where they have presented to us in advanced disease uh, with intact shentenza, where uh, with an adductor tenotomy and arthrogram, you see the head is very well contained. The main one of the problem is overgrowth of greater trochanter. And this child was seven years old. And uh, so we did uh, eight plate placement along the GT. And uh, you can see the follow-up. Uh, this is two years follow-up. The disease has very well healed and the greater trochanter has not shown any overgrowth and mechanically this child is showing good, good weight. So one can use in Perthes disease, but when you are doing a virus key rotation, you can always do a drill epiphyseal disease. And uh, even if you want to do percutaneous drill epiphyseal GT, that is also a fairly, uh, fairly uh, accepted option. Finally, we tend to use uh, uh, tension band plate for deformities secondary to distal femoral bar formation. So we have used it in with bar resection, whether it's traumatic or infective. Let me show you an example. And this paper shows that it is an effective way. So this boy had an infantile infection with the uh, distal femoral bar with exaggerating valgus, as you can see the growth plate axis. And the growth arrest line shows that there is no growth from the medial side. And on MRI, it shows that the bar was about 30%. But as the child was pretty young at four years, I thought, let me give a chance to excise this bar and put a tension band plate on the medial side. 
So uh, this is uh, after surgery. I place the metal markers to see whether it is working or not. And this is in uh, July 2015. And in 2016, you can see the growth. The uh, growth plate is now neutralized. In 16, uh, uh, the the deformity got completely corrected and little over corrected. So I removed the metaphyseal screw, thinking that if I need uh, again, I'll just put a screw in. You can see the metal marker is progressing further. At a seven years follow up, uh, yesterday this child came to my clinic, and you can see the metal marker has grown uh, further. Uh, although this deformity is corrected and the the marker is going up, the face is sick, so this child is short by a few centimeters. This is his final scanogram at seven years follow up. His deformity is completely corrected, but he is short and he is now uh, due for limb lengthening procedure. So take home message uh, is uh, uh, growing children with angular deformities can be treated with growth modulation. As the lecture is too long, I have not discussed the growth modulation used for limb length discrepancy management, which can be, which will be dealt with uh, in other sessions of limb length uh, discrepancy measurement later. Uh, it's a very simple and uh, gradual correction. The parents should be intellectually sound or you need to make them intellectually sound about the way this technique works and the need of implant removal in time. Uh, and one must be aware about growth potential and the health of physis before considering this treatment. So thank you very much. And I hope this uh, lecture uh, has helped you uh, in your decision making about growth motivation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a very nice lecture. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, first question is from Anil, sir. How do you use growth modulation for deformities greater than 30 degrees? Yeah, so uh, there are two subset of patients I have seen. One uh, is the patients with idiopathic genuvalgum or, meta or the metabolic disease there, if the disease is well corrected and child has a growth remaining more than two years, then we use a growth modulation. Uh, uh, and then they, we have seen those deformities getting corrected. So uh, the children with uh, growth residual growth of more than two years, even you can try to correct more than 30 degrees. The other subset of uh, patients with hypophosphatemic rickets where they have global deformity. So we apply uh, eight plate fairly early in the course and then we explain family that diaphyseal deformities would be corrected near skeletal maturity. The third subset is the skeletal dysplasia um, uh, like uh, achondroplasia or hypochondroplasia. And there, uh, as the physis is sick, it takes pretty long time. There, my decision is based on intellect of family also. No? Some family which are not, uh, we are reluctant or not understanding. So I do acute correction by doing a dome osteotomy in proximal tibias and uh, might do a bit of hybrid, uh, put an eight plate in the femoral side and acutely correct the tibia or, or vice versa, depending on where the magnitude is coming. So uh, for skeletal dysplasias, I do osteotomies and for all other uh, patients uh, with uh, residual growth of more than two years, I would do uh, uh, growth modulation. Okay. I have put, sir, I have uh, tried putting for the skeletal dysplasia, I have tried putting both in the same uh, distal femur. I do osteotomy as well, but do not overcorrect it and leave the eight plate in place so that any residual deformity which comes on later or anything left due to uh, incomplete osteotomy gets corrected by eight plate gradually. And I use the eight plate as fixation device for osteotomy. So use a longer plate, yeah, longer yeah. plate, bridge the osteotomy site with eight plate. The osteotomy mm -hmm. in, the, in this children unites fairly early by six weeks. So I give a cast for six weeks and thereafter the eight plate acts. Okay, that, that's, that's a fair thing. And we have seen that uh, some of them, although their mechanical axis, uh, they are corrected, but because of ligamentous laxity, you know, they, yes, they yes. still 
so uh, keeping an eight plate uh, is not a bad idea I, we recently we did in hypochondroplasia and uh, i overcorrected by 10 degrees but still in six months time the deformity recurred and i had to uh, use uh, eight plates so yeah that that is that's a good option Second question is, uh, can we use drop modulation in uh, acute crickets? In acute, sorry? Acute crickets. Acute nutritional crickets. Because okay. we have, after this corona time, we have a pandemic of these cases yeah. and everybody comes with deformity. So, either to treat them metabolically and wait for two years time for them to remodel, and the other option is when they come with a deformity, you treat both metabolically and apply the eight plate. Have you used them for acute cases? Yeah. So uh, uh, the acute patients, we, we term it as a lockdown syndrome. And uh, they have long-standing vitamin D deficiency. And they have also associated proximal myopathy. So uh, I, they have a lot of pains. Um, in the uh, in the extremity now we know that by in three months therapy of vitamin d and calcium they all uh, recover by in their pain so if the child has substantial growth remaining then we uh, uh, make the metabolic disease heal but the patients we are near, near adult as a near puberty we would treat it simultaneously and we would not wait for the disease to heal completely because if we try to wait for three months six months then their uh, residual growth will be limited. So I, I make sure that uh, if they have around two years, see what we have seen is the degree of correction is one degree per year. So if a child has two years growth remaining, that is 24 months, or one degree per month, sorry. So in if deformity is less than 20 uh, or 15 degrees, then you can uh, wait for metabolic disease to heal and then you can put your plates. But when they are skeletally mature, near maturity, now I started uh, using PAC screw, then the eight plates, because PAC screw uh, has shown to give uh, earlier correction beginning than the eight plates. Uh, sir, next question is, how do you decide plate size with respect to screws? Uh, so, uh, Plate size is, uh, usually there are four plate sizes are available. Classically and, uh, three, sir. Classically three. Yeah. So in this uh, universal uh, set or the prototype Pega, even I have done it in uh, Sikki. So they have four sizes, four different color coding. So you, uh, that is for proximal tibia, distal femur, even ankle. So you can put it various places. So what I do is I put the central wire and I put plate and I make sure that uh, there is enough space for the screw to be uh, uh, placed. Now we all should know that the blood supply of the physis or growth plate comes from the epiphyseal side. And the epiphyseal vessels or E vessels, they lie in very close proximity to the growth plate. So if your epiphyseal screw is very near to the growth plate, then there is a chance that you are uh, you are damaging the blood supply. So your epiphyseal screw is, should be little away from the growth plate. And that's the reason why people are advocating putting first the epiphyseal guide wire, and then you put the metaphyseal wire because your, the blood supply of the growth plate is not from metaphysis, from the epiphyseal side. So, so I, I choose the size based on that my screw should be away or at least five millimeter from the growth plate. Yes, sir. So, next question is, what's your take on growth modulation in pseudoarthrosis tibia before it fractures? Now, I know that there is a paper showing that doing growth modulation in patients uh, uh, with kind of pseudoarthrosis, they are, they are pre-fractured patients and they have used growth modulation and they have shown that growth modulation induces deformity correction and they fail to uh, they do not fracture. But now I, I have four patients of uh, post neurofibromatosis pseudoarthrosis, which have not fractured. And I have been observing them. Few, a couple of them have reached skeletal maturity and they have remodeled completely. So that paper has a fallacy that uh, they, there is no control. 
they have not taken in account the patients which were not uh, undergone uh, eight plate placement i have i myself have three or four cases where i've just splinted them and they have corrected completely they have remodeled completely so uh, vivek i, I do not uh, put eight plates in uh, pre fractured nfs but i feel that uh, if we protect them well and if they are uh, they are not going to fracture then they will remodel Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, anyone has any question, sir? Uh, next question is from Sudanshu, sir. Role of eight plate in CPMB? CPMB. What is CPMB? Sorry, uh, Sudanshu, I'm not good at abbreviations. Sir, congenital posterior medial bowing. Good morning. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. Good morning. congenital postero medial bowing so uh, i mean this is this is well proven that uh, congenital postero medial bowing patients they they correct uh, uh, they correct in their deformities uh, as they grow and we know that by 7 years both the coronal as well as sagittal deformities correct some children uh, have uh, persistent ankle valgus so i when i was young i used to do osteotomies and growth modulation for ankle valgus in uh, this uh, congenital postero medial curvature but i found later in few more of patient that they they recover completely so i don't think we should do growth modulation for those patients who are going to improve naturally you know so this is my practice dr anil agrawal uh, do you do growth modulation for C uh, this now i learned a new term cpmb uh, sir i observed them for 7 years yeah. Yeah. if they don't correct spontaneously we still have several years left the main problem is not of deformity it is of the shortening length of the length, yeah. length. so, yeah, so do length, compensate length that. yeah do compensate that and you can wait for the deformity because most of the things will be clear by 7 years of age if you require the growth is also remaining and you can also do a osteotomy at that time so uh, sudan so i uh, i do growth modulation there the, see average discrepancy uh, in cases of congenital postero medial curvature is about 4 to 4.5 cm and there are some children who have discrepancy less than 3 cm and if parents are tall and long i would do contralateral proximal tibial uh, uh, guided growth of to correct the limb length discrepancy there i use it but most of the kids with 4 and 1/2 cm or more we do limb lengthening near skeletal maturity you know? next so, question is uh, have you used growth modulation in cubitus varus no i i have not used it uh, i have always done osteotomies do you have any experience of using it uh, dr das or dr anil osteotomy only sir uh, i have done osteotomy i have done uh, i have tried two three cases but uh, i am not sure ha have you done growth yes, modulation yes 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 tried two three cases oh okay uh, i i got a report somewhere and i have tried it but uh, my experience is also not satisfactory so you you can share this uh, to us i mean i have never done it uh, you know so i i i don't know how how it uh, works because the distal humerus is a slow growing physis so we have always resorted to osteotomy rather than <coughs> growth okay. but i would it will be interesting to see your cases okay. uh, my my question is yeah. uh, do any regarding this yes. surgical procedure uh, any problem you face while doing the tbl uh, to getting this uh, plane so i think i think sometimes muscles come in between my experience is what do you cleanly do in lower, lower end of the femur any problem you face in tv yeah so uh, what i have seen is uh, with proximal tibia we do not see any uh, problem even when you put a proximal medial plate for uh, Uh, for this, uh, the, we don't see problem with femur. Sometimes we see stiffness. 
so one thing is before you close uh, intraoperatively you flex the knee to the full and once you flex the knee to the full and then extend again look at the iit because the one time it happened so that when i flex the knee fully it was a metabolic bone disease untreated so the in, the screws backed out a little bit so i had to retighten them but the uh, the row uh, the key is you always flex so any uh, impinged muscle or any tethered muscle will get separated you know so before you go out you you flex the knee to the full now saying that even after doing this in in some patient i have seen stiffness uh, i was talking to other colleagues like sandeep uh, and uh, some senior colleagues and these they encourage children to drive bicycle and do swimming in post operative period after 10 days and that helps reducing their stiffness i have seen girls they the girls are very um, they they are very slow to resume their normal work boys are very active uh, and in uh, i would say about 20% children uh, or patients i have required to take help of therapists and again physiotherapists work for two weeks and their movements are restored uh, in one patient uh, we were on the verge of doing manipulation under anesthesia but that child also improved i had worked with taral and he had one patient where the knee stiffness was such that he required to do uh, uh, manipulation under anesthesia but uh, that 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 is a problem at times and some patients have uh, pain and some patient have persistent synovitis even though we put the screw bit more medially one more complication that jayant sampad has reported uh, and sheetal has also uh, warned us about is while you put a medial distal femoral plate and if you violate the uh, what do you say that is patello femoral ligament then some patients have shown lateral patella dislocation after putting medial distal femoral eight plate so those are very rare cases and we might have done around 200 cases we have never experienced it uh, but but this these are the reports uh, i had a patient uh, uh, a girl where there was a very severe periosteal reaction all across the Uh, starting from the distal metaphysis to the proximal diaphysis now that girl was from good family she didn't have uh, scurvy or anything but uh, what happened is there was bleeding from the proximal screw side which kept on collecting underneath the periosteum and that led to a very very big periosteal reaction making removal of that implant difficult so i had one experience and i can share those x rays with you all so yes we see some random complications with this method but they are not uh, uh, they are they are forgiving complications and uh, it is always better than doing major osteotomies uh, and plating and implant removal for the conventional treatment many times uh, while doing this uh, uh, bronze type of bronze uh, plate uh, very difficult to locate also the crisis in lateral view if it is fine for lateral view is the growth plate create also some uh, technical problems in the exact location of the growth plate yes yeah that is right uh, uh, for that you know what <clears throat> you can do is uh, i mostly do it by clinical uh, palpation and uh, most of the time you feel the condyle and then try to put it in the center and as you that is an undulating physis so you need to see a dead lateral view of uh, to make sure that you are in the center uh, so that becomes challenging at times but either a cross table lateral and you a good iit technician is needed and uh, sometimes the figure of 4 you can do figure of 4 and then uh, try to manipulate the image intensifier and make sure that both the condyles are overlapping in the lateral view and then that is a uh, your that's a point where you should be in the center that at times it is challenging but with the experience you know like uh, one can do it very quickly right so uh, i think we don't can i say something about stiffness yes jaydeep yeah 
लास्ट इयर वी प्रेजेंटेड अवर पेपर इन पोसिकॉर सो स्टिफनेस इज मोर इन एट प्लेट सो एज यू से प्रीवियसली इंटरऑपरेटिव फाइंडिंग वी कैन चेज समाइम फेलो और अदर कलिंग विल टाइट टे तो वी हैव टू चीक आफ्टर पुटिंग द एट प्लेट whether any soft tissue is gone under under surface of the head plate that is very important second is when we finishing surgery as you suggest is knee manipulation as we see lot of stiffness present in obese and female child those who are a pamper child to have seen at literature say it is a day care procedure but we have compare pet screw versus the head plate there is more stiffness in head plate it will take at least 2 to 3 weeks to get full range of movement extension lag at least 4 weeks and sitting and squatting take more than 1 month yeah this is a conclusion is, from our that is the right that's that's right but pad screw you know uh, using pad screw in younger children they always carries risk of permanent no, not i'm saying the younger just saying the comparison uh, no no i i, I know yeah, that uh, i agree with you completely so although this pad screw is looking very attractive uh, but the one we should uh, confine its use in near skeletal maturity patients because there are yes. reports of uh, permanent fissure arrest in some of uh, some series after yes. pad screw so so we we from pad screw we have moved to tension band and now from tension band uh, plates to this uh, uh, again to that uh, so the stiffness as you rightly pointed out in obese and and a female child from affluent families, uh, we see. So the key thing is to mobilize them uh, when yeah. you are in... So okay, one paper, in you can start from the day one, the physio, whether they have paper from JPO, whether we start physio within one wing or three weeks. So those who have started early physio, specifically some special kit, they will give the good results. Right. At the same time, you know, uh, I, I would say that uh, the physio... It was required only in less than 20% kids. So uh, doing therapy for all the kids is also not essential, you know. And some boys, you know, they are so playful. On day two, they are they are sitting in cross-leg position in my clinic before they go home. So I don't know. But uh, for uh, now, I have started explaining to the families uh, of very obese children and the girls, especially that we might need help of therapist if child fails to bend the knee fully. So I uh, can I concur with your uh, observations. Thanks for sharing it, Jain. Thank you. I think uh, uh, we should go with this uh, with the complications of eight plate talk uh, from Dr. Anil Agarwal, senior registrar. Dr. Ang Ang yeah, please share your screen. I hope you can share your screen. Anklesh, Dr. Ankleshwar. Uh, good morning, everyone. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes. <clears throat> I'll be uh, explaining, uh, I'll be discussing some cases regarding the complications of it, which we faced in our institute. <clears throat> the first case is a six year old male child. He was a case of multiple epiphyseal dysplasia with spinal deformity at DL junction with bilateral gene welcome uh, right side more than left side. This was his spinal deformity. We can see a kyphotic deformity at the DL junction. And this was his clinical x-ray, uh, clinical photo showing bilateral genu valgum. And this was his uh, uh, scanogram. <clears throat> we did a bilateral uh, hemiapiphysiodesis of distal femur and proximal DBA using uh, medial eight plates. And patient lost to follow up. And after... <clears throat> patient presented to us with a... Uh, deformity of genu varum on bilateral sides more on the right side compared to the left side. When we ordered a scanogram, uh, we could see there's a uh, screw breakage on, uh, on the left side. Metaphysical screw has broken. And this was his scanogram. Uh, my uh, <clears throat> questions are, uh, what are the possible reasons according to you, sir, for screw breakage? And what will be the next plan of management? So, I uh, yeah, can you go back to previous x-ray? I'm, uh, what is this big scar of? So this is uh, uh, fibula grafting. Ke liye jo, uh, fibula. We use fibula for posterior. Uh, yes, Achha. For the spine? Yes, sir. Ah, okay. May not, not fibula, but probably tibial sheen graft. Tibial, tibial. It's tibial. Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. tibial yeah. 
right so uh, now this is a very well known phenomenon yeah go ahead in your slides yeah so this is very well known phenomenon that is uh, if the patient is not presenting well in time it will lead to overcorrection as as in the case i have shown and uh, mostly two things can happen when the overcorrection starts as we know that our eight plates have span of 30 degrees if it is more than that either the implant will come out to accommodate more correction or the the screw will break at the the head and the shaft junction so that is what has happened here and even after breakage this is not a it acute kind of breakage you know it's a gradual it's a gradual stressing stressing of the implant and it it, it will not lead to pain to the child so even after breakage the child has not come and you can see that screw has migrated up and on the right side uh, if you wait for few more months it would break on that side as well because the plate has not come out now now i, I can see this uh, the play, uh, growth plate is still open so you, you can revise it you can remove this plates and put it on the outer side and that will correct the deformity and this time now you inform them this right side is more deformity than the left so you will need implant removal in two separate sessions you might need to remove implant on left side earlier then so he should consent you for three surgeries now yes, but that can be corrected with growth modulation yeah. <clears throat> sir do you remove the metaphyseal screw the broken no, part no. of the screw no 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 you don't need to do that yes, it sir. will not act as a teaser don't worry it is broken and it has gone away so you don't uh, waste time in removing the metaphyseal screw now broken screw uh, we did uh, we remove the implants on the medial aspect and mm -hmm. we left the broken part of the screw on the metaphyseal screw okay <coughs> and, did not uh, uh, apply the opposite side sir we just why, waited why? because because growth is still remaining at we just want to talk about how much does it rebound okay okay if it doesn't yes. rebound so, yeah so then that the paper of rebound you know the rebound is uh, uh, is seen only in uh, 30% patients and in 70% patients there was no rebound that's one in 10% patients even after removal of the eight plate there was uh, progression of deformity uh, in the correction mode so and and in 60% uh, it remained neutral so and in this deformities in your case looks uh, more than 10 degrees so even after removal of implant even if it rebounds that there will be some residual deformity so maybe after waiting for some time you may consider uh, if it is not coming up you can consider placing yes we are planning that we are planning to observe for 6 months at least yeah yeah anglesh sir proceed yes sir the next case is a 4 year old child Uh, with pfft proximal femoral focal deficiency uh, with a limb length discrepancy of 2.5 cm on the right side this was her clinical picture and this was her scanogram <clears throat> we did a uh, uh, medial and lateral uh, hemi epiphyseal disease of distal femur using uh, eight plates of contralateral limb to control the uh, to correct the limb length discrepancy and this was follow up after eight weeks we can see a bulge on the medial aspect of the left side <clears throat> on doing the x rays uh, we can see the deformity remained uncorrected after 8 months uh, with metaphyseal screw backing out hmm. so my uh, uh, questions are what are the possible reasons for the failure according to you sir and what will be the next plan of management sir so there was no valgus uh, before the growth modulation right it was a straight extremity no sir the uh, 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 bilateral genu valgum tha sir present patient acha bilateral nahi nahi जीनो वेलकम नहीं था कंक्लेशन इसमें और दिस वाज इन द डिस्क्रिप्शन सर यस सर फॉर दिस डिस्क्रिपेंसी के लिए या सो 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 द क्वेश्चन इज व्हाई द पेशेंट डेवलप्ड जीनो वेलकम यू नो आफ्टर डूइंग दिस इवन दो वी हैव प्लेस्ड एट प्लेट्स ऑन बोथ मीडियल एज वेल एज लैटरल सरफेस आई आई हैव नॉट एक्सपीरियंस दिस बट यू नो what i feel is the your uh, the screw placement on the right can you go back to the x ray first yes sir yeah 
so uh, the the implant placement is also absolutely all right uh there is uh with growth there is some backing out of the screw on the medial side yes. and it, that probably has not led uh, the physis to stop growing from that side so physis has kept on growing and with the faster growth the screw has backed out and once the screw has backed out it kept on growing so the patient has developed janu valgum the plates on the lateral side is working well and the plate on the medial side is work not working that well that might be the reason now uh, what is the limb uh, lateral view yeah so that is again a, a good uh, observation sidanshu that we must make sure that on lateral view the, the both the plates are in center and sometimes it happens so that one side plate is bit more anterior and the screw trajectory is not holding the whole of the physis do we have any lateral x ray uh, dr so right now we have not put yeah so that that is that there's a good point sidanshu and that might be one of the possibilities so okay. now you know uh, the question is what i would do is uh i one option is you just um, remove the lateral plate and uh, reposition the screw on the medial side and let the janu valgum get corrected and once it gets corrected you insert the lateral plate again to induce growth uh, modulation for limb length discrepancy that is one the other thing is i would uh, take a lateral view and i would uh, reposition the screw keep that implant and i would cheat a bit put a medial proximal tibial aid plate and let the deformity get corrected from the uh, tibia because this is this does not look a very gross deformity so you will cheat from the tibia and uh, align the mechanical axis keep the uh, growth modulation and discrepancy management as it is just uh, change both the metaphyseal screw to a straight construct and put a medial uh, aid plate so that's uh, that's the other option you can do Okay, and Klesher, proceed. So, so we remove the metaphyseal. Took the first option, sir. Okay, so <laughs> you did. Uh, okay, so you place the screw and you remove the metaphyseal. That's fair. And cap the lateral plate as a sleeper plate. Yeah, and once it gets straight, you can put the screw through the uh, metaphyseal hole. That yes. is also fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's also fine, but it it will give some length to the femur. So. i hope you have time to uh, you know catch up the length 3.5 cm from distal femur means uh, the child should have at least 4 years growth and i think child seems young so you will be able to achieve yes. that yeah yes okay yes okay that's that my good. question uh, dr anil hello uh, yes sir uh, my question is whether the screw should be divergent or should be parallel with the growth plate any uh sir we prefer putting them divergent because that like in, in elizaro that takes up the stress and your plate acts early for parallel screw i feel that they take some time to divergent and then act so it's a basically if you put them in a divergent position they are pre tension position and they will act more faster than a compared to a parallel plate although both acts although both are uh, shown to work Uh, suppose uh, you are placing a screw in divergent, so what about only 15 degrees can diverge? From the beginning, if you are correcting the around 7 to 10 degrees, so another 5 to 10 degree correction is there. After after that, it will come out. What is your opinion about that? Uh, because this screw only gives 15 to 30 degrees. Yes. So if from the beginning we will diverge, uh, so say 7 degree or something like that, or 50 percent. There only 50 percent. So I I agree with your question, Doctor uh, Doctor Das. Now the if you read the paper of Peter Stevens, the first paper, and he says that you need not to be absolutely parallel. You if if it is a bit divergent, then also it is fine. At the same time, they are saying that. Uh, the one screw divergence gives you 15 degree correction so if we are aiming at more than 30 degree correction then it means that you might have to re uh, replace your screw again once you achieve optimum correction so my my uh, uh, 
i do not mind if there is mild divergence because most of the deformities you know they are not too uh, too much uh, like it's not in excess of 30 degrees but in deformities which are bigger to start with we we try to put uh, screws parallel in this modified technique of uh, drawer pele again they are emphasizing that you put an transverse epiphyseal wire and then you put a transverse uh, metaphyseal wire which are parallel to each other uh, so they are coming uh, up with a parallel screws so a bit of divergence should not make any difference as long as deformity is not too large so uh, i think we we had a session with peter stevens and if someone of you uh, if this point is being discussed that whether the screw should be absolutely parallel or a bit of divergent so that it remains pretense if some fellow can go through that dr stevens sir, discussion sir he recommended a divergent screw yeah i i read i read his initial technique video and he has mentioned two three times uh, we should not mind wires if they are bit divergent not they, he can not recommend but he said that we should, it should be okay if, if the screws are bit divergent Fine. So he recommended. Uh, yeah. Uh, suppose deformity is more if you convert. Yeah. So what is your idea? Uh, sir, I don't think the eight plate works by just by opening the uh, opening of the screw with respect to the eight plate. It's basically the screw holding the lateral, uh, providing a tether to the physis, and it is not that the deformity will correct only when the screw will open. We have several cases in which the screw remains static. still the deformity corrected so deformity does not always correct by opening of the or diverging of the screw so it's, it's a tension bend principle uh, rather than the screw but at the same time you know dr uh, anil we have seen that some patients once there is enough divergence of screw the plate starts uh, backing out yes that's and correct and in, in your in your case you you saw the breakage of screw that's again because the the deformity is not the uh, you know uh, it has gone beyond the span of your screw so yeah so that that needs some discussion and uh, maybe we should inquire with dr stevens himself this what is it speed that's a nice point dr sakti but i have never placed a uh, convergent screw right it, it is either parallel or little bit divergent not never convergent right Let's, do we have any other case Yes, sir. the last case, a eighty-year-old child presented to us with bilateral genu varum. This was his clinical picture, and this was his scanogram. <clears throat> child underwent bilateral hemiapiphyseal disease or distal femur and proximal tibia using lateral eight plates because of severe changes. So this was his uh, post-op X-ray, and child lost to follow-up due to COVID, and patient presented to us four years post um, the primary surgery. and this was his clinical picture <clears throat> child now developed the geno by little geno uh, valgum deformity and this was his uh, fresh uh, x rays and scanograms my questions are sir what is your follow up protocol how often do you call the patients uh, for follow up and what is the end point of plate removal and uh, how do you decide sir when to remove a plate is it age dependent uh, whether child attained a certain uh, age whether the deformity has corrected itself or not you have to replace the plate or do okay, uh, sure, just proceed we have short time just proceed to the next slide i just wanted to ask a question to yes we remove the plates in this case and apply the opposite side sir just proceed further ankur sir sure. yes uh, the question here is that Uh, have you found permanent changes in the epiphysis post application of the eight plate do application of eight plates deform the epiphysis shape so uh, the case which i i have shown the bar excision you know uh, where i did bar excision from the lateral side and place medial eight plate uh, although the the metal marker is progressing proximal showing that the femur is progressing but the physis is sick so the child has developed discrepancy so there are certain areas where the physis was already not very healthy putting an eight plate across may make it further sick you know uh, so that that is that's the thing and in 
we already discussed that uh, the rebound, uh, I mean, the loss to fall off. There are a few papers on it. And they have also found which patients uh, may uh, in, are prone to get overcorrected. One is if the patient is from some other language, you know, they have found that the patients who are not speaking English in there, uh, they could not probably understood the importance of uh, timely follow-up. The same practice happens in our center that the patients from very remote area that we feel that we have made them understood that they have to come back uh, at every three to four months and they need to remove implant, but they do not understand the importance of this. So you have, besides communicating with them, now I try to show them one, the case which I have shown to you, we show them practically uh, on uh, the TV that, see, this can happen. Your deformity will go the other way if you do not come in time. So this is a right observation. If the patient is from some other pro state or if they are not understanding your native language, then there is a chance that they would not understand even though you explain to them and then you should show some pictorial things to for them to understand it better. <clears throat> and second is very obese children they do not recognize the correction of deformity uh, unless very late. And sometimes by the time they recognize that deformity is corrected, it is, it is overcorrected. So these two things, the foreign language and very obese children, they are highly, highly likely to have overcorrection. And we must reinforce just like in Clough Foot, you know, every four months you have to come. Every four months you have to come. I do it for the patients who come from Kolkata or from South. South. They, they send me scanograms. They send me pictures if they cannot come. Uh, uh, but uh, we make sure that we are in constant touch with them. Yeah, so here we can see that the <clears throat> in order to correct the deformity, probably we have created uh, other deformities, that, but mechanical axis should be well aligned. You know, that's the key. I think uh, it's about one hour and 20 minutes. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so thanks with those were very good cases and I hope best for this uh, cases. Uh, thank you very much everyone for your participation. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Sheenam, you can conclude today's session. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we have covered everything. Uh, if no one has any question, we should uh, wrap this up and uh, you can post in the group if you have any question. And uh, Sheena and Meet has collected a wonderful uh, set of uh, literature on growth modulation and they will share it on fellows uh, academic module. I see some general orthopedic colleagues uh, part uh, of this meeting. If you want to become a member of this fellows more group, just let us know. We will enroll you there. And then you will also get <coughs> access to all that literature. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm ending the meeting. Take care. Thank you, sir.